Uh, let's go back to the ESG fund by uh, BlackRock. Um, that's something really funny there. Uh, it also has a performance chart. Basically, it tells you when you started in February 11 and you end up in February 20. You know, this is really the, the fund's performance. Uh, depending on the history, it looks different. So, if there were a crash somewhere, you'd probably start after the crash. We had the crash here in 2010, 9, 8. So, they start after that crash. Then it looks really good. And what was really interesting here to see is that they, they, they put something uh, which is called um, benchmark uh, to compare to. So, and implying here basically, this is almost like the benchmark. It turns out what is the difference between the benchmark and your, and, and your fund is called the tracking error. You've heard that word if you've been here yesterday already. The tracking error is, you know, how much la do I lag behind my benchmark? Sometimes actually I'm in front of the benchmark, sometimes I'm behind. More often you're behind because you're not fast enough to buy the stocks or you want to buy them first for another client. Who knows? <laughs> you don't know. You cannot get that information. It's impossible. Um, it turns out we lose 1% over the 10 years, which is another 0.1% every year. Yeah, it's a cost that you are not, you know, you, you look at the cheap index fund, the SMA you can buy for maybe 20 basis points of 0.2%, but you have to add 0.1% because they just don't pick the stocks the right way. I don't know where that money uh, gets lost. But the worst thing is actually this type of chart. And I'll show you as an example, I have a good friend who went into uh, wealth management and um, he has his own company, he's very successful. And um, he came to me a couple of years ago, it's 2016, and he showed me, you know, let's call him Andreas, how well he performed over time. And if you compare that to a really prestigious fund like Big Day or LGT, you know, you know, they were a lot worse, you know. And uh, I looked at the chart and I was like, yeah, it's really good. You know, since 2004, we're now in 2016, that's more than 12 years, really a long period. And it's completely outperforming. Does anybody see something suspicious on that chart? It's really hard to see. It's really hard to see. Yeah, volunteer? It actually follows the same path. Yeah, that's what I, that's what actually got me working. <laughs> like, you know, it's actually quite similar if you take out, you know, from here, from here, it looks actually quite similar. And what I did is, he, he used that chart to convince me, or try to convince me he performs better than the index. And what I did is, I went to look in what year did he actually perform better. So instead of using that chart, I plotted down all these points, I had to do that from hand, because of course it doesn't give you the data. And it turns out, that's how it looks if you look at annual change in the portfolio. And you can already tell now that, you know, here in 2005, I think, you know, Pictet outperformed. In 2009, Pictet outperformed. In 11 as well. In 13, they were the same. 14, they outperformed. 15, they outperformed. And 17, they outperformed as well. It turns out in 8 versus 6 cases, Pictet outperformed Andre <laughs> in that year. And suddenly it looks very different. He basically only made money once here in the credit crisis. If I want to invest in Andre, I should only do that if I expect another credit crisis. Because he may actually do better again because he's quite smart. He makes a lot of money with that work. If I look at the most, more recent time frame, if I start in 2010, not much later, they could actually perform better overall. Now you think this is constructed. This is just, you know, Andre, um, my friend uh, Andreas uh, was also at the high scale. <laughs> so you would think like, yeah, this is just a high scaler. And of course, he, he, he kind of, <laughs> he cheats his way around. But you know what? Um, there are others too. Yesterday, the exact same chart was pre presented by a professor from Lugano. I don't want to blame him. It's done over and over again, and I want to take a picture today as well from the Credit Suisse uh, presentation, the yeah, UBS presentation. If you look at that performance, you come to the conclusion, you know, Switzerland does really well, but if you, if you just pick another, you know, if you just start here, for instance, you know, compared to Europe, then Europe would be up here, Europe would completely outperform Switzerland, and it's something you cannot see. You, you know, you could probably look at this one correctly, you know? But then, you know, just a little bit later, um, 
we get the exact same chart. You don't see here, but basically it was another metric outperforming for a while here, and from here on, just going in parallel. As a matter of fact, they dropped more, the one that the line that we liked better, than the line we didn't like so much. And they didn't drop as much. Maybe because they can't drop as much. And my conclusion is really don't ever trust this type of graphs. <coughs> It's, it's, it's done by everybody, and what is completely forgotten is not that they are misleading. I mean, you could use the graph that I drafted, and of course. The problem is the time frames we are looking at here are way too short. Every statistician that you tell you, 2004 to 2019, doesn't mean anything. If, if an economist does an analysis, it has to be 30 or 50 years, and nobody's around to prove for that long. It's just... It's just it's just a, a matter of fact, unfortunately. That doesn't mean people are not outperforming. I believe LGT and uh, UBS and uh, Safra Sarasi do a very good job in active management, but they cannot prove it with numbers. This is the, the big difference. I think active management makes a lot of sense, but do not try to prove it with numbers. It's always misleading. Be honest about what you do, you know. That's why I say, I do it this and this way. And if that worked over the past 10 years, it doesn't even matter, because we also know things go in cycles. We forget that. We tend to forget that, that, you know, investing is a little bit like life, you know. If you have a certain style of investing, it performs very well. And then there's a time when it doesn't perform well, like the last 10 years. Dividends have really performed very well. Value investing has performed bad. High-tech investing has performed really very well. And when you, when you base your investment decisions on past performance, it means you buy here and you buy, you sell here. You buy here and you sell here. Because you always buy, buy the stock or the fund with the best performance then it's, when it's peaking and you're selling when it's actually at the low point. I have this uh, insight from um, a company called uh, Research Affiliates who is trying to do another way of weighting of the indices they perform. <laughs> and the CEO there said, don't buy our phones. They're totally overvalued. You know, Research Affiliates is here and the CEO gets getting really nervous that, you know, because of his investment funds all performed so well, they are now really expensive. And if people now move in, they're all going to be disappointed. And he was honest enough to say that. In addition, um, that performance is such a bad metric. Um, there's also there was also a, there's also a risk metric that is lo used a lot, which is deviation from the mean, from the market mean. Uh, the, the beta was discussed today. I think it was discussed yesterday as well. And if we assume now that um, this is a market index, so let's let's do it a little bit differently. Right? If we assume this is a market index and. This market index today is dominated by tech and oil companies, you know. Let's say, let's take oil companies. How would an oil company probably perform because it's dominant in the market? It would probably be similar to here. You know, somebody in the future will realize that oil doesn't have a big future. I don't know about the future, but maybe it could be that these oil companies don't have a good future underperforming the index, you know. And if you then compare, if you then measure the beta that you look today, um, then this beta would be quite low because it still would move with the market because it's a large stock. If you take a wind company, wind energy for instance, you know, it doesn't have anything to do, even if it does like this, it's going to have a very bad beta. It's going to have a lot of deviation from the index. So when you look at this, it has nice words, you know, Markowitz was the big, the big term yesterday, the, uh, what's it called, uh, risk adjusted return, you know. Risk-adjusted return gives you a good risk-adjusted return for the oil company and a bad risk-adjusted return for the wind energy company just because wind energy is not yet dominant. So the second most important figure um, is again something that is really dangerous to rely on. 